Hello, I am Spaghetti, you know. And welcome to episode 6 of more Dungeons and Dragons stories from people on the internet. You know? Shit. I'm late, but I'm telling the story anyway. So my character is a little bit dumb and very naive. Average intelligence, but low wisdom. My dungeon master and I have discussed it and we decided it's down to her upbringing as spoiled rich girl who ran away from home to escape an arranged marriage. As such, whatever plan I come up with first is the plan I usually suggest without thinking them through at all. This does not usually end well, but the most disastrous was the incident with the ogre. Our group had headed into a town to investigate why all the women had been taken prisoner and all the men had been killed. Our plan involved disguising our warlock and fighter as orcs using disguise self and taking me to the group of prisoners collected in the town square to see if we could gather more information. Our rogue would follow and we were praying our wizard would manage to sneak around as well. He ended up splitting the party to go look at a church with one of the disguised orcs, which kind of solved that problem. Anyway, we get to the town square through a series of lucky deception checks and there is a massive ogre with one arm guarding the prisoners. Where his other arm should be is what was basically a rudimentary flail, which had been stuck into the stump. Our DM took great pleasure in describing how lethal it was. He also took a great deal of time talking about how much metal was impaled into the ogre's arm. We had recently leveled up to three, and I had taken heat metal. He knew damn well I wanted to use it. He knew I wanted to prove myself after a few sessions where I hadn't done much damage. He also knows how to encourage my stupid plans because he's an ass. I cast heat metal on the arm, and he looks me in the eye and rolls to see whether the ogre panics, and then to see how many innocent dwarven women he kills while trying to rip out the arm to stop the effect. It was a lot. He did let me have a few rounds of damage on the ogre, but it probably ended up killing around 10 innocent bystanders. After casting Dissonant Whispers, which afterwards he told me I really should have cast in the first place, I succeeded in getting the ogre to run into a collapsing building which killed it. Would have been much cooler if all those people hadn't died as well. I ended up getting probably another 8 civilians killed and the rest trapped in that session. My group have taken to calling me racist because I have now killed even more civilians through various incidents but have never killed any humans. Probably after 200 hours of play, we were all level 7 to 8, nearing a critical point in the campaign to save the world. By some stroke of luck, we had all the players playing. Usually we have 4 to 5, today we had 8. I was the cleric, my friend was a fighter who had just learned to read, and was reading some of the mage's books in his free time. I was not your normal cleric. I started out as a life cleric to pump out heals, but I died, and instead of letting me make a new character, my dungeon master brought me back to life as a death cleric. This was the way of things. So we were coming up to a power generator like no other. There was 12 demigods surrounding a central point, all locked in prisons that drained their power. Among these were all manner of powerful beings such as divas, solars, oni, powerful demons, and at the heart, a lich. Me being a death cleric with Bane as my god, went to bargain with the imprisoned lich. After a long conversation and some wheeling, the Lich and I came to an agreement that if I freed him, we had to stop the generator, he would pledge himself to Bane as his god, and would be able to go on his merry Lich way and do his Lich things in the name of Bane, and the best of all, not kill us. At least, yet. All was well and good, but then the fighter remembers a name he had read in a book, who was more powerful than a Lich, that could defiantly help us. The dungeon master didn't tell him this name, he read about it in a first edition book we had laying around. So he starts asking about him, and says his name, as I free the lich, Orcus. The dungeon master rolls percentage, then silence hits the room. He rolled a 1%. A portal to the other world rips open, and a fat beast with beast legs steps out, looks at the fighter and speaks his name in the language of death. He drops dead. He looks at us. The party with the freed lich in front of them, as well as 12 powerful demigods and demons now freed from their prison, and laughs, and casts us 300 years into the future, completely derailing our campaign. 
the old god that we were on a quest to not let get released was released, not Orcus. We were sent into a world that literally had a planet that was broken. Now we have to now find another way to save the material plane we were on, and are starting from ground zero in a future that is riddled with chaotic evil. We thought this campaign would end around level 9. We are all level 9 to 10 now, and don't even know how we are going to find the new source of power and the old god, who is no longer trapped. The species with the most living creatures left in the world are giants. They are the only ones who can survive the onslaught of this god, and they aren't doing it well. We ran to the Underdark, for safety. I was playing a 24 hour long game once. No sleeping, just one continuous game session. And a complicated setup plus sleep deprivation resulted in some silliness. So our D&D world was at war. It was grim. One of our party, for example, had turned into a twisted, miserable shell of his former self when the village where his family lived was brutally massacred by the enemy. He'd never been the same since. And in fact, as a cleric, was frequently haunted by the ghosts of his fallen friends and relatives, goading him onwards for vengeance. Why is this relevant? Well, after 20 or so hours of play, which would be about 30 plus hours awake, the party is battered, beaten, and lost in the middle of a highly dangerous forest behind enemy lines. Decision making had become more difficult, so when we found a strange, highly magical stone structure in the shape of a torus, we did what any good party would do, we stepped through it, to an entirely different time of day, night in fact, and after coming up with a brilliant idea to read the stars as to when we were, it turned out that we had gone back in time before the war had started, before that village, and the cleric's family was brutally killed. We could save them, or could we? Standard time travel shenanigan issues plagued our sleep-deprived conversations. If we went to the village and fought off the army, then the village would be saved. But our vengeance-seeking cleric would never have become vengeance-seeking, and we'd never find the time portal, so we'd never save the village, etc, etc. Our heads hurt. Suddenly, like the rays of the dawn's light through the window, I had an idea. I shouted down everyone else and begged them to listen for a moment, to ensure that I wasn't completely exhaustion drunk. We pretend to let the village get raided. The cleric cried out in outrage. He accused me of making a mockery of his pain, that the ghosts of his family made it quite clear that they had died in that terrible day. But I could handle this. The plan, then, was that we go and evacuate the village secretly and hire a team of gnomish illusionists to cast illusions of normal village behavior, right up to and including the moment when the village is raided. They make illusions of people getting brutally murdered and the bloody aftermath. Outrage from the cleric! Wait, no. We then keep the illusionists around the village to await his arrival, and we create the illusion of what he remembers seeing as his younger self, the remains of his loved ones in his arms. Cleric still isn't happy, and can't see how this will work. The ghosts, remember? I've got that too, and it's the same trick again. We get the gnome team to follow the cleric, creating illusionary ghosts to haunt him for the entire time between the village massacre and the moment we walk through the portal. They'd have to keep hidden, but gnome illusionists would be great at that. There's a pause while everyone's sleep-addled brain stumbles to catch up with the consequences. Because if that's what we do, then that's what we did, and the village was never massacred. It was an illusion, but how could we test it? How could we know that we had succeeded? I called out, asking the gnome to finally reveal themselves, and lo, they did. They walked out from behind a bunch of trees. The cleric, finally understanding the ramifications, broke down in tears. The gnome said that his family was safe, or rather, his family will be safe once we go and recruit their younger selves. As for me, coming up with that little bit of time travel fuckery was pretty much the last bit of brain power I had left for the session. I considered it payment for the sleep I then immediately took. One additional element that I can't remember where it fit in the story was that we figured we'd better make a mark of some kind to indicate that we'd done this, so that if we did it again, we'd know we'd been here previously. How? 
One of our characters spun around randomly and walked into the forest, picking a decent sized tree to carve a tally mark in. They came back a few minutes later, white as a sheet, but we were all too busy to notice. Why so shocked? The trees over there were entirely covered in tally marks. Hundreds of thousands of tally marks. Props to the dungeon master who was as sleep deprived as us. I used to play Pathfinder quite a bit. It now falls on a day when I work unfortunately, but the times I had were great. I had a character named Jimmy Cripple. I've mentioned him in threads like these before. He's a dwarf bard with a peg leg, formerly part of a traveling performance group known as the Flying Cripples. He got into an accident while rehearsing for a performance and that's how he got his peg leg. This basically caused him to roam the world to do some soul searching and find himself in hopes he would eventually become a better performer. One of my favorite things I did with him involved a one-liner and a glass of liquid feces. Our group was in a crumbling sewer that was in a sort of pea shape. Two members of our group were in the stem of the pea and they were backed into a corner by a group of goblins. The rest of us had made our way around and found the barracks where the goblins had come from. While in the barracks, I picked up a beer mug, then went outside where the sewer was and filled the mug with liquid feces. I snuck up behind one of the goblins, just within throwing distance, and yelled, Hey, your beer tastes like shit, and lobbed the mug at the closest goblin. I didn't roll a 20, but it was still a high roll. I think it was around 17 or so. So it hit. The mug ended up shattering, doing damage just from the blow. The goblin rolled low on constitution, so he started to throw up from the fact that he was now covered in shit. The blow also caused knockback, causing him to fall into the sewer water and drown in shit. So yeah, I killed a goblin with a mug full of shit. I haven't played in years, but I remember a campaign where, in addition to our normal quest plotline, we were being tracked by this sketchy character on horseback who played this ominous tune on a flute while on our tail. Our group just had a bad feeling about the guy, so we were constantly trying to give him the slip. When you least expected it and thought there was a lull, you'd hear the damn flute playing in the distance and knew that fucker was creeping close and we'd hightail it out of there. But no matter what we did, eventually that asshole would pick up our trail again. This goes on for days. When we finally finished our quest, we decided that we're sick of running and are going to make a stand. We take our defensive positions and wait. Guy shows up cool, confident, and unflinching like Clint Eastwood and calls out our teacher's name. We're thinking, okay, it's on, here we go. So our leader rolls up on the guy ready for a scrap Dude hands him a letter and rides off playing his damn flute. He was a fucking courier. We were all trapped on a sci-fi prison ship in space and had to escape. My character looked exactly like Tom Cruise. Only spoke in one-liners and wore only tidy whities and a pair of 90s sport Ray-Bans. I ended up being covered in blood after biting a guard to death then massacred 15 with a laser rifle, broke it in half, used the two jagged halves as spears, then again bit another to death before being almost strangled. Good times. Too long did not read, half-naked Tom Cruise may be a cannibal. In my first D&D campaign, we had a player who constantly got killed trying to keep another player alive. She usually died as well, usually by attempting something she had no business doing. For example, she was playing a wizard and attempted to pickpocket a high-level skeleton king. Eventually, he got tired of it and decided to play a young girl warlock. The best moment of this character happened when she was talking to a cute official in his office. She did not get her way, so the player turns to the dungeon master and he says, Okay, I stabbed myself three times screaming for help. The dungeon master was silent for about three solid minutes and just said, Okay. In a later campaign, I was the storyteller for World of Darkness. It was a survival horror. One of my players wasted the time they were given to ask the big bad questions relentlessly asking about his top hat, then begging him for the hat. He finally gave her the hat and told her to leave before he called the killers in himself. In my vampire campaign, it was my second. I had by far the best times. I played Clan Toreador, which meant I had social skills. I once seduced an entire bar in a single role. 
I also once accidentally summoned Cthulhu over a large arena of people. Good times. I miss that campaign. I once had a character that was obsessed with butter knives. It started when I searched a body and that's all he had on him and I just said fuck it. I ended up having over 500 butter knives. One of which turned all blood cut with it turned to butter once it hit air. That was a fun campaign. And that's uh, about all we have for now, folks. Thank you for listening to these stories of Dungeons and & Dragons and Pathfinder and other stuff from the internet. Thank you. If you enjoy this content, please like, please subscribe, and I hope you guys have a wonderful day.